Welcome. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Asher Kitshana B'mitzvotav, V'tzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So let me share this with you. And we are, of course, in Tracte Kiddushim. Uh, Kiddushim, and uh, here we go, a new chapter. V'aydaber Hashem el Moshe lemor, and Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, V'el b'nei Yisrael tomar, and to the children of Israel you shall say, Ish, ish, every man, me b'nei Yisrael, of the children of Israel, Umin hager hagar be Israel, and from the stranger who is residing in Israel, Asher yitin mizar o, who gives of his seed, or Safaria suggests offspring, la molech to molech, mot yumat, he shall be, but he shall surely die. Am ha'aretz yirgamuhu ba'avin, so the people of the land will stone him with a, with stones. Let's say with a stone. It actually was one stone alone. That was it. So uh, the molech, the issue of molech, was mentioned before, and Rashi explains again on the basis of rabbinic tradition that molech was the name of one of the idols. And that there was, when it says, uh, as we notice, it says, who gives of his seed to Moloch, that there was a practice there. In another place, it talks about uh, the walking between pillars of fire or between uh, um, places where fire was burning. And uh, that, the, that that was the way in which this was particularly worshipped, this, this particular idol was worshipped. So let's take a look here at um, Rashi, the El Bnei Yisrael Tomar, and to the children of Israel, you should say. So he says, On Shin Al Ha'oz Azharoi. He says, this particular section deals with the specific punishments regarding the prohibitions. So the prohibitions were mentioned in Acharemot, many of these prohibitions mentioned in Acharemot, and here, the consequences are mentioned in this particular parsha. So, mot yumat, again, why the duplication of this particular word? And this is according to the Sifra, Torah Vanim, the Beitin, that it, they should be put to death uh, in a court, so that a court has jurisdiction to inflict capital punishment. The im ein koach and if the Court does not have enough uh, authority, perhaps we could say, or koach literally means strength to administer the punishment. Am ha'aretz, then the people at large, mesayin otam, they help them. So they can go outside the court if a decision is made that this person is guilty of this particular crime, then they can appeal outside the court for people to help them with the uh, execution. That's at least how I'm understanding. So Am Ha'aretz, this phrase Am Ha'aretz, by the way, these days, the term Am Ha'aretz, and this is based, I believe, on rabbinic, uh, on rabbinic language, refers to an ignoramus, someone who in, has no knowledge of Jewish law and Torah and things like that. But here it doesn't mean that at all. Yes, Judith, Somehow this sounds a little bit like um, mob violence, lynching. It, yes, except here it's with a court. It's not allowing people to just, you know, for the mob to rule. By no means, I cannot imagine for a second that the Torah would, you know, countenance such behavior. But what they're saying is that sometimes the court does not have the wherewithal to, to actually, um, you know, carry out the sentence. And basically, they're saying, at least as I understand this, this is just based, of course, on skirting the surface here, that they can go and appeal to others to help them. Um, I can tell you how... How is that different than why would the court not have power? Why would the people have power to do have, it? 
Oh, no, here the power is not jurisdiction. Here's the, I believe that the power has to do with the, the man power. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. They may not, so apparently they do not have people who who are appointed by the court uh, to in fact uh, carry out the sentence. That's what, I believe that's what they're talking about here. I would have to see, but it hasn't, it does not have to do with the decision-making. I do not believe that it has to do with that. You know, I can, we can look and see uh, other translations of Rashi and see what they say there. But um, well, Chabad says, um, if the court is not physically powerful enough to kill I mean? them by themselves, right. the people of the land must assist them. Exactly. And so it says Torah Kohanim 2091. Right. So that's the uh, rabbinic, yeah. early rabbinic thing. That's how they're understanding Amaretz. But it would absolutely be to clarify that it's not, not mob violence. God forbid. Right. So this is okay. So let's keep going. So um, Haaretz, they're defining that. J Judith, are you satisfied with that answer? Well, no, but okay, so um, what, because, what, what's concerning you? Go on. Because uh, you know, we have discussion after discussion after discussion where there are, you know, words are used twice instead of once, and what's the implication? And you know, I guess I'm speaking from a position of having been a lawyer yes. and working with courts. And I mean, how do the people carry out an execution if the court doesn't? I just can't imagine. Well, it would be under the supervision of the court. We're talking here strictly about manpower. That's all. In other words, oh. the court has the authority to get other people to, to you know, back up their decision. Go ahead. I think mob violence implies unruliness. Correct. So this is a group that is committing an execution, um, which you know can be looked on as a violent act, but it's le a legally violent act, just as um, war and and uh, some other types of of violence. But it's not an unruly mob just willy nilly doing whatever they want to somebody. There are rules and governance and and they're helping out with, with that. Right. This is not a lynch mob. I mean, look, I think we have to deal with our concerns about, about the actual executions, right? So I think, I think there's also, you know, there's also the sort of negative space about this, because what it's saying is that in other cases where it says simply yamut and doesn't say mut yamut, it means that in that particular case, the court doesn't have the jurisdiction to do that. So they may have found this person guilty, but they're not in a position to actually carry out the execution. The truth is that if you actually look into all that Jewish law has to say, or a great deal of Jewish law has to say about, about capital punishment, it's there, it's on the books, it could take place. But basically, there are all kinds of safeguards to prevent that. But I think that understanding the implied negative side of this positive statement, it's saying that in this particular case, one has to be rigorous about it. But in other cases, one isn't. So, I mean, that's what I'd have to understand, that it's going to require the scripture to say, mot you mot, for us to say, well, if the court doesn't have the you know, physical capacity to carry out the sentence, then they can go and you know go outside the normal you know, hire, so to speak, and get people to do this. But Judith, I, I don't want to cut you off. If you still have concerns, you know, if you're not satisfied, I, I want to try and satisfy your concerns. I'll I'll keep going and assume you're just having think, some... Yeah, go ahead. I just um, was shocked by this. You know, I'm... I don't understand why other people, I guess, why the court wouldn't have the power to do it. But in their circumstances, they simply may not have the manpower. All right. It's just, you know, I'm looking at it from a, a position today. Yes. Uh, you know, is, is, is this like uh, having private prisons? 
with all the, you know, there's all these safeguards built in. Mm. And then here you're not putting it under the, and I don't know. Just, I still see safeguards. They're not, it's not saying that you can just, just turn them over, turn this person over to the mob. That's not what this is saying. It's saying that the court has a duty to carry out the sentence. That's what it's saying to me. That's what I'm hearing. I'm not hearing, oh yeah, just turn them over. That's not what it's saying. They would have to, again, under supervision, they would have to go out and, and find people to carry out the sentence. Again, that's a whole different issue, right? Uh, the whole issue of capital punishment is a, a different one altogether. Anyway, okay, I am yeah. going to, but, you know, again, if you still want to discuss this, I'm open to it. Otherwise, I will go on. But, you know, you don't have to mute. And if you need to raise No, I'm, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I'm all right. So this this strange expression, right? So according to the Torah Konyim, Am Shebigino Nivret Haaretz, the the people on whose account the land was created. In other words, we do have this sort of theological position that God created the universe and certainly our world because of the plan to have human beings in it. That ultimately that was the reason for creation. And and I I I don't see that as much. I mean, I think superficially we can say, well, that's certainly implying importance to human beings that isn't uh, in any way uh, backed up by scientific evidence. But that's not the point. It's not a scientific statement. What it is saying is that if we don't take care of the land, I mean, if anything, this is a great statement saying that we have a responsibility that this was done for us, that, that this is an incredible gift that, that God has given us, and that consequently we have a huge responsibility to behave properly and to, and to, and to try and maintain the land and to be stewards of the land, etc. That's what this is talking about. So that's one way to understand this particular phrase. Tavar Acher, another interpretation, Am she'atidim lirash et ha'aretz, right? This is also another point, by the way, that I, I feel in some ways we need to consider nowadays. So at, at the point where Moses is talking, you know, getting this mitzvah, that they are, they're not in the land of Israel. They're still on the way to possess the land. And that's what this is saying. Am she'atidim lirash et ha'aretz, a people that in the future will inherit the land Al yidei mitzvot mitzvot halalu, by means of performing these particular commandments, and I think that that's this particular notion. Um, sadly, I think is not a, people are not aware of this, and if they are, they don't necessarily give it much credence. But the whole idea that whatever title we have to the land of Israel is based on performing mitzvot meaning living lives that essentially are lives of service and righteousness and justice and equity and honest business dealings. We saw that yesterday, you know, that that's, that's the basis on which we are able to sustain our presence on the land. And if we stop doing that, then guess what's going to happen? We're going to lose our title to the land. The only difference is that for the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, it, it, it's a temporary thing. It is not a permanent thing. But that's, I think, in some ways saying that, you know, that because of this is the merit of the of our ancestors, that that we have this privilege. And it is a privilege. So onwards, let's go on. Okay. So this, by the way, the, the Torah keeps going on to emphasize how this Moloch worship Whatever, you know, whatever we need to understand by it, right, is is just a terrible, terrible thing. So going on, but ani eten et panai ba ishahu, and I will set my face against that man. Vehichrati otomikir of Amor, and I will cut him off from the midst of his people. Imizaro because of his seed, Natan Lamolach. He gave to Moloch. Laman, 
in order, and in doing that, right, Tamei et Mikdashi, he has defiled my sanctuary, Ulechalel et Shem Kochi, and has uh, profaned my holy name. So again, we need to understand what is the effect, what's supposed to be the effect of these particular uh, statements. And in general, I would say that very often, because these are things that we might see as venial sins, right? That they're really not that particularly big a deal, right? That that's precisely why the Torah wants to state it in this kind of way, to sort of awaken us, to, to, to shaken us awake, to say, you may not think it's a serious thing, but the fact is that it is a serious thing. And by the way, we haven't finished with these consequences, but let's go on with Rashi right now. Okay. Et ten et panai, I will set my face. And again, all done early, early interpretations in the Sifra. Uh, pan, panai shili pone, ani, sorry, panai shili, simply my face, right? Panai. Pone ani miko is, uh, iski the osek bo. I'm going to turn aside from all other things that I'm doing. And I'm going to busy myself with him. In other words, simply saying, this is a priority. It's a priority issue. Of course, not really understanding entirely what Moloch worship is, isn't all that helpful, all right? Uh, on the other hand, it's maybe a good thing that it's kept vague. I'm not certain. We might be shocked if 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 we had a different understanding of it, right? Ba'ish, in that person, that man. He says, and the reason why it says Ba'ish is as a distinction from the community. Interesting, by the way, uh, exception to this, that is to say, in terms of the consequences, because the entire uh, community, the entire public is not cut off. So karate is something that's only done on an individual basis, it's never done wholesale. Ki mizar or natan la molach. All right. So because of his seed, he has given to molach. And this is mentioned in the Torah Kohanim, the Sifra, and in the Talmud, Sanhedrin, Samach Dalit, page 64. Le emar ma'avir beno uvito ba'esh. Right? So because earlier on, it's mentioned in the Torah that it's talking about passing, causing his son or daughter, it says specifically son or daughter through the fire, right? So again, we're going to look at this in, in a sense in, in terms of legal, right? So it says specifically son or daughter through the fire. It doesn't say zar or his offspring. It just it specifies son or daughter, Ben Beno or Ven Bito, what about his son's son, in other words, his grandson, or his daughter's son? Minayin, how do we know they're included in that prohibition? Talmud Lomar, and for that reason, here scripture says, Ki Mizar O Natan Lamolas, because of his offspring, he has given his seed, he has given to Moloch. So seed would go through all the generations. Zera pasul minayin. But when, how about it says his son or his daughter? But how about any, what about if the son or daughter is illegitimate? Minayin. How about that? Talmud lomar betito. That's why scripture adds the word betito in his providing of his seed to Moloch. So what's going on here is we're having a, a classic rabbinic interpretation of words that appear to be unnecessary uh, for the basic meaning of this particular law and using these specific examples to either exclude or include other categories. Leman tame et mikdashi, right? In order to defile my sanctuary. So what does it mean here? Here, interestingly enough, Mikdashi, my sanctuary, doesn't mean the temple. It doesn't mean the Beit HaMikdash here. It says, et Knesset Yisrael. We're talking about the community of Israel. 
as a matter of fact, uh, it's Solomon Solomon Schechter, Dr. Solomon Schechter used to love translating Knesset Israel as Catholic Israel, right? In other words, the Jewish people in, from a universal standpoint, Shehim is because the community of Israel is sanctified to me, designated to me. Kalashon, according to the language, in other words, similar to the language in Leviticus 21, and he should not uh, defile my sanctuary. But there, the context clarifies that it must be talking about the Jewish people and not the sanctuary itself. Right, and should the Am Haaretz close their eyes? Right, look at all the duplication of words here. Right, shut their eyes, et enehem their eyes. So, elam elam is the word we use for a blind person. In other words, if they should intentionally blind themselves, min haishahu from that particular individual. In his giving of his offspring or his seed to Molech, the vilti to the effect that they would not hamitoto, that they would not in fact carry out this capital sentence. Let's take a look. The im alim yalimu, right? If they intentionally uh, avoid dealing with this. Im ha'alimu badavar echad, and he's explaining now the duplication of the language there, and what it's suggesting is im ha'alimu badavar echad, if they choose to avoid one matter, sof shiyalimu bidvarim harbe. In the end, they won't consider anything. They'll basically overlook many things. In other words, we know right that. Sometimes what an action indicates is the real motivation and not the specific. In other words, if you if you have an excuse for one th for a particular thing, and if you don't have that particular excuse, you'll find another excuse not to do this. And I know it's not exactly the same example, but it's the same idea. There's a you know there's the statement that if you if you're not generous when you're when you're poor, you certainly won't be generous when you're rich. The whole notion of generosity, the whole notion here of being committed to fulfilling the divine law, okay, it's the same thing. So, another example. Im elimu sanhedri katana, if a minor sanhedrin, a small sanhedrin of 23 individuals don't, you know, want to ignore this particular case, Right, sof shiya limu sanre dreg dola. Then, in the end, the large Sanhedrin will also not pay attention to this particular case. The large Sanhedrin was the one that met in the chamber of human stone in Jerusalem initially, and consisted of seventy, seventy or seventy-one uh, judges. So, so if the if so, in other words, if it's saying if if the human courts choose to overlook this particular thing. The samti ani et panai. So again, I told you this goes into a whole bunch of, uh, you know, expressions regarding this particular molach worship. The samti ani et panai ba ishahu uva mishpach to. He says, I shall set my face against that individual and his family. Right? Ve chirati oto and I will cut him off the et kol hazonim acharav and all those who go astray after him, these not acharei hamolech to go astray after the molech mikerev amam from the midst of their people. I know this is very very tough stuff. So clearly, you know, he's the one who did the molech worship. What about the family? Why are they brought into this? Amar Rabbi Shimon. So Rabbi Shimon said, Vechi mishpacha machata. He says, but wait, in what sense did the his family, what did they sin? How did they sin? Ella, 
However, lelamecha to teach us to teach you she'elecha mishpacha she'yeshba moches moches to teach you that no family that has a tax collector, right? And one of the people are tax collectors. This is not considered an honorable profession, at least back then. Probably because there was a lot of uh, you know, bakshish going on and stuff, dis, dis, you know, use of, abuse of government power. She'en kulam mochsin, right? You don't have a family that has one tax collector where they aren't essentially all tax collectors. She'kulam mechafin alav, because all his family are going to try and protect him. They're going to try and justify his behavior and stuff like that. And that's the sense in which they are held accountable. Vehikrati uto, I will cut him off. Lama neemar, why is this stated? The fish neemar over mishpachto. The reason why it says I will cut him off, right, is because it mentioned prior to this and in his family. Yachol yu kol hamishpach ka behikaret. It's possible we might have thought, right? We might have inferred that his that the entire family is subject to this karet, Talmud Lomar Oto. And for that reason, the verse is Oto, him. In other words, he's the one who gets cut off. Oto behi karet, he is the one who will be cut off. The law kol hamishpacha, but not his entire family. Does that mean they get off? No, they don't get off. However, the law kol hamishpacha vehikaret, they are not going to be cut off. Ella veyisurin, but they will face tribulations. Lis not achar hamolech to uh, go astray after the molech. Talmud Torah Kohanim again. Right, so this constant repetition of this particular idol, the rabot she'ar avodat elilim. Right, this is actually to include all other kinds of idolatry, she'avda bechach, who are uh, who are served in this way. For afilu ein zo avodato, even though, in other words, this idea of tossing between the fire, I believe, is what's being what's being uh, highlighted here, because it says, that even if this passing through the fire is not the worship of that particular idol, even if that's, it's, not, it's not normal for a source of worship, nevertheless, the consequences are the same. That's the same. Uh, so we are going to stop here. And uh, we will, with God's help, we will continue this possibly next year. Okay. Let me stop the share and let you, if anyone wants to comment any in, at all. Oops, sorry. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, so... So it's a, the last part sounded like guilt by association. I didn't think we for the family, right? And it, <laughs> I, I didn't think we supported guilt by association. No, so we, we don't. We don't. We don't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So hold on one second, David. I'm having some technical difficulties here. Let's see what's going on. So I'm saying stop the share. There we go. All right. Yeah, I know. And that's why Rabbi Shimon had to say what he had to say. In other words, you know, families have, are influenced a great deal and they're also, um, you know, they have to bear the consequences of what they tolerate. So, you know, that was the point about the, you don't find a family that has a tax collector that isn't going to defend that person. Right? <laughs> okay, yeah. I mean, look, again, one has to be careful, I'm sure, you know, that when you actually get down into the application of these things, of course, it's not it's not everyone, et cetera, et cetera. And it isn't strictly a situation of guilt by association. But on the other hand, we do have in in, as I understand it, to be corrected, that if you're an accessory, you are still held liable in any, you know, if you're an accessory. And 
In this case, this family is acting as an accessory to someone who is apparently this diabolical practice and are tolerating it. You know, and think about it. If you have a family and there's a child molester who's a member of that family and they all know he's a child molester and they don't do anything about it. You know, we know it's very difficult when it's a member of your family, you know, to turn them in. But yeah. it has to be done. It has to be yeah. done. And if you don't, if you don't, then it's saying, you know, we're going to up the ante to make it a little bit more worth your while to do this. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think that the point is, like, you know, whether they knew or didn't know, right? So if the, yes, if it does. The, I mean, that's, yeah. So where, that, that's the key point. Yeah. I would makes agree. Sense. Yeah. And that's where the application of issues goes comes in. Okay. So thank you.